Hello YouTube, this is the first video in a new series of videos that I plan to do every one or maybe two months. Lore lectures. Once every now and then I will record a video like this one to a live audience of Patreon supporters, as if giving a university lecture. Every one of my Patreon supporters, no matter the pledge that they do, $1 or $20, I don't really care, they can all attend them live while I record and at the same time get the opportunity to ask me questions about the subject we discussed at the end of the video or while I'm discussing it. Then the best questions that I receive I will edit into the end of the video. Now the lecture you're about to watch is a tryout for this concept so I took a concept and a subject that I was pretty familiar with but in the future I plan to do way more diverse stuff. And that said, let me know what you think of this concept, this lecture concept. I personally like this concept for once in a while. So, without much further ado, let's kick off with this lecture. So, uh, welcome to the first lecture everyone, since this was planned kind of shorthand I will do the lecture twice or maybe multiple times probably because some of the people that are attending today can't make the full lecture and I have some people that do want to attend the lecture but are not able to come at this time. So for other patrons I will do the lecture over but then it will be off the record uh, but you can still ask your questions. As you know that this first little lecture is basically a tryout. Uh, future lectures might be longer or might even be shorter but then in a series. Uh, but for this time I've chosen a small standalone subject with potentially a second or even third part to it. But I wanted to test out the format of these lectures first before I went into very big plans. As those patrons who are attending this uh, have been informed, this lecture is being recorded and your question too will be recorded and either I will cut them out of the final video or keep them in if they're relevant and you consent to having them into the video. You will be muted during the lecture and afterwards you will get the opportunity to ask me questions about the subject we have discussed today. Or if you have pressing questions you can send me a message on Discord and I will unmute you when there's time for questions. So, today's topic with the Elder Scrolls Blades being around the corner and it, well, playing in the direct aftermath of the Great War, I thought it would be nice to see what we can expect in terms of Tamriel's situation right after the Great War, so directly in the aftermath of the Great War. In this lecture I will be focusing on the Empire in this as, uh, well, in a potential second le lecture I will analyze the situation in both the Dominion and Hammerfell, but why only the Empire now, simply because for the Empire, the aftermath has been the most interesting and because we simply know the, the most about the Empire in the aftermath of the Great War and what happened and what the effects were. I will not be speculating too much about the story of Elder Scrolls Blades uh, because I don't really think it will be a very story heavy game. And in this lecture I will instead focus on the wide situation across uh, partly Tamriel but mostly in the Empire at the time of the year 175-176 of the Fourth Era. Now, if you take a look at the map that I provided you before the lecture, I will put it on the screen for our friends on YouTube that watched this recorded lecture. You can see that in the year 175, uh, where we are now in this map, I'm sorry I need to take the map myself, uh, that basically the southern lands of the empire, how much damage has been done to the countryside. Basically the extent of the, uh, of the damages in these lands are all speculation by me, but I think that the damages that I have uh, added to this map are basically solid uh, um, speculation. Because we have quite contradicting sources on some parts of the Great War. The, well, the main parts of the Great War are pretty clear to us and they are made also pretty clear to us in the book The Great War, which outlines the general uh, things that happened. However, some smaller stories within the Great War are told to us in dialogue and they seem to contradict. And that's why I made uh, in this map some very weird choices. As some of you might see, for example, the little part next to Bruma, which is basically very much inland and still has minor damage. And so, yeah. According to some, the maximum extent the Dominion actually conquered Cyrodiil was uh, only maximum the Imperial City and only surrounding it and not going any more north in terms of conquest. 
However, this can be disputed since we also know that the Dominion was able to attack Cloud Ruler Temple, which is basically in the direct, direct proximity of Bruma, hence the color next to Bruma. However, we also know that they did not conquer Bruma, so I personally think that the army that attacked Cloud Ruler Temple was most likely not the main army, but a separate source army sent by Narafin into Imperial territory with just the intention to sack the headquarters of the Blades, which was Cloud Ruler Temple. So, the exact intention of this attack can only be speculated on, but assuming that this was just a raiding army and not an army bound for conquest, we can also assume that more raiding armies like this one were sent into the rest of Cyrodiil to raid villages that were lightly protected at the border of what was conquered. So hence the um, drawing I made with the minor damages. Those are basically damages done by raiding armies. I speculate. This is pure speculation on my side as we don't know the exact movements of the armies. This all leads me to assume that, as I said, much more than just the conquered territory in southern and mid Cyrodiil was seriously damaged. But if you look at the map, I have drawn my personal interpretation of war damages on it. And let me explain why I think that this map is probably the most accurate depiction. As you can see, on this map I indicate that the area around and inside the Imperial City has sustained the most serious damage. I think this is because the area has seen devastating battles between the well-defended Legion and the Dominion armies in the winter of 172. And in both the years 173 and the spring of 174. The battle over the control of the Imperial City that raged in this area for more than a year and a half uh, and that probably did a lot of damage to the countryside there and then later as a sort of finishing blow in the year 175 the Battle of the Red Ring would once again take place in this area. The other very damaged area that I've marked on this map is around Braville as you can see and this is because Braville has been under a very long siege in the opening years of the war and that siege was also a little over a year if I remember correctly and a year of war would do a lot of damage to that area. Then I have marked the areas that have been under Altmeri direct control and the areas that saw other forms of hard combat uh, under the medium damage category. These areas have sustained damage however since the most parts of these conquests happened very early in the Great War and happened rather quickly. I do not think that a lot of damage has been done to this area. Well, yes, a lot of damage has been done, but not to the extent of the area around the Imperial City and around Braville. I mean, in these areas probably the most damage were military damage in terms of overrun forts, broken equipment, etc. However, I do not think that the damage to the countryside itself will have been nearly as great as the damage suffered around the Imperial City, which saw basically two years of full heavy combat. Now, I've also marked the areas around the Concord areas lightly uh, as lightly minor damaged. We know no major offensive went into this area, but I can imagine minor skirmishes taking place here, as I said before. In terms of raiding parties that went a bit inland to just raid villages or, for example, attack Cloud Ruler Temple. Now, with these damage indicators, I try to think not only about military damage, but also about economic and morale damage, and of course loss of population. The Imperial City by far lost the most uh, of their population, uh, while a city like Leowin, which was quickly overrun and occupied in the beginning of the war, would have suffered less in population losses. I mean, they would have lost some, I must assume, but not nearly as much as the Imperial City, which saw a full sack. So, I think that if you take this map as an indicator of overall damage to the area, with all types of damage included, it gives a good overview of the Empire State directly after the Great War. But damage to the country isn't the only type of damage the Empire suffered during the Great War. The Empire had lost about 50 to 70% and some people even claim 80% of its legionnaires. We don't know the exact numbers, but we do know that some legions were completely eradicated. And that, well, the other legions the Empire had left were all in Cyrodiil and there were no reinforcements left. As all remaining troops were in Cyrodiil according to the book The Great War, which is our main source for Great War information and is a pretty accurate depiction and pretty neutral depiction to a certain extent of uh, the Great War. Although you could say that it's from an Imperial perspective, but... Most people argue that it can be taken as fact, the book. 
And of those remaining legions that were remaining in Cyrodiil, not only one legion had left more than half its men for duty. Had more than half its men left fit for duty. So the assumption that the Empire had lost at least 60 to even maybe 70% of its forces after the war isn't too weird of an assumption to make. Whether all these soldiers were dead or were just heavily wounded is another question entirely. We don't have data on it. Uh, we only know that they didn't have the fighting force left. And if you could take heavily wounded soldiers that can't fight anymore but are still alive also at, as lost soldiers, then I think you can well very much assume that they lost at least 60 to 70% of their active uh, fighting force. The Empire had also been completely ec economically drained during the war. We know that Skyrim and High Rock, uh, while they saw no direct combat, were, were drained of economic assets and men to be able to sustain the fight in Cyrodiil and Hammerfell during the war. Because uh, the, the war there really required all of the Empire to fight on those fronts. So men were pulled from High Rock and Skyrim and also their economic assets were largely pulled, most likely, uh, to be able to finance the war in the south. Both Skyrim and High Rock must have been at a well, pretty much economic low at the end of the Great War and Cyrodiil's economy was, well, nearly destroyed. Save for maybe the northern cities, uh, depending on the extent to how much they've been raided. Uh, how much combat they've seen in general and uh, to what extent they are still capable of trading during the war. But I personally think that they have also basically been in a sort of frozen economic state during the war. After the war ended, the terms of the White Gold Concordat came on top of all the damages we've seen so far. The Empire lost one of his most valuable allies, the Blades Organization, which was now outlawed and hunted down by Thalmor operatives across Tamriel. The worship of Talos was banned and the loss of Hammerfell as a province after Hammerfell rejected the terms of the White Gold Concordat. I must say that I think that the loss of Hammerfell was ultimately very favorable for the Empire, but well, I will get to that in a second. Um, I will explain my reasoning for that later. A lot of people really compare the Concordat that was ultimately signed to the ultimatum that was proposed to the Emperor at the beginning of the war. And while its major terms are similar-ish, they are also very different, those two um, little treaties. As in the first ultimatum that the Dominion uh, demanded of the Empire before the war, they demanded large sums of money from the Empire and this was completely absent from the White Gold Concordat as far as we know. In the White Gold Concordat, the Empire most likely received large sums of money from the Dominion in war reparations. I really recommend my watching my video on the White Gold Concordat for this, however, we do have strong indications and a theoretical basis to conclude that the Empire received money from the Dominion in war reparations. And not a little bit, no, a lot of money we're talking about here. This money would have played a key factor in the quick restoration of the Empire that we have seen in the years after the Great War. And as we know from dialogue in Skyrim, even the Jarls from Skyrim, who hadn't seen any combat, received generous amounts of gold after the Concordat was signed to rebuild their economies and keep their people fed in basically an internal market that has been, well, essentially frozen during the war. So. Well, where did that money come from? Most likely from war reparations, as the Empire would have no chests of gold left to give to their Jarls after the war, unless they received it from someone. These war reparations were probably not only sent to Skyrim, but also sent to the Kings of High Rock to make sure their economies were going in. Uh, and I mean, when you lose, you lose a lot of population and trade and productivity, and basically your security has been on an all-time low, for several years, a huge injection of gold uh, spent in a clever way can get you very far in things, uh, getting back, getting things back on track. And I saw that Rakerin had a question. So, with I was really thinking about the ec sort of economic destruction of the empire at the hands of the Thalmor, and um, it seems like there's kind of no hope for recovery, um, especially seeing a lot of damage being done in the heartland of Cyrodiil. Um, it's really common strategy, at least historically in our world, for farmland to be burned um, and topsoil to be removed. So that way um, you can't grow food. You can't grow food. You can't have any more babies. 
can't have any more babies, no more soldiers. Uh, and as you said, even receiving payment from the Thalmor, it seems like it's going to be a real tough fight, and they're going to seem they're going to need something short of a sort of Numidian style miracle to really even think of winning this sort of long scale political conflict that they're in. Well, um, while you didn't really ask a direct question, I see it as a comment. Well, basically, my question is: uh, Is there hope? It seems that uh, it seems that you know, in the grand strategy uh, uh, of the their political situation, it doesn't seem like they're really winning on any front. So, is there hope for the empire? What what would it take to see a see them sort of bring bring them back to the state we see them in towards the end of the third era? Well, bringing the Empire back to what it was during the end of the Third Era, I don't really think is possible at this point. But to elaborate a little bit of, on, on what you said, um, the Empire basically, yes, probably a lot of farmland was burned in the in Cyrodiil at least. And probably also Hammerfell, but that's no longer part of the Empire as we know. And I will comment a little bit on that as well. But seeing as uh, that the Dominion most likely could have uh, paid the Empire war reparations, as we as I concluded before. Those war reparations were nothing. I mean, the, the Jarls of Skyrim received large chests of gold, like large chests of gold, each of the Jarls apparently, to repair their economies. And those chests of gold must have come from somewhere. And that would have probably been the Dominion. So I see the White Gold Concordat as more of a trade like, okay, you can have your Talos ban in our lands, but we want money to rebuild ourselves. And seeing as the Dominion also fought a long scale war, I mean, it was it, the Dominion also lost a lot of soldiers. Don't 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 mistake that. And you must see that the Dominion's economy must also have suffered during the during the time. So. Let me think about this for a moment. The Dominion's economy was also kind of frozen at the, at the time, certainly near the end of the war when they gambled all available resources on the war in Cyrodiil to just have it be done. And after that point, the Dominion must have also been, well, poor. Because at least it... it, it sorry. It wasn't as poor as the Empire at, this, at that point. But when the Empire defeated their entire army at Red Ring and they lost all their soldiers on top of the fact that they had gambled all their available resources on that, they also got struck a pretty heavy blow. And because the, they, didn't, they did no longer have the Orpa Vermina, which was basically their little trump card to win uh, the first years of the war so very quickly, they didn't know what the Empire had left. They did not know that what the Empire had left in Cyrodiil were the only troops the Empire had left. Because they were thinking, whoa, where does this entire, where, where do all these troops come from? So they signed the White Gold Concordat with the idea, okay, uh, we also need peace now. Because we don't know what the Empire is capable of at this point. Not knowing that the Empire isn't capable of anything at that point. And when they basically signed that, they gave the Empire their money. And then the Empire gave them this Bondman of the Blades, Talos Worship, uh, disbanded in the Empire. And the southern regions of uh, Hammerfell. But sorry, I'm trailing off, but I'm coming to the answer. So this means that what you say that if there is hope for an eventual win against the Thalmor is... I would say yes, because the Empire has, from what we know, uh, if, if I believe... I don't know who it was, it was one of the members of the Legion who came from Cyrodiil and if you ask him in Skyrim how Cyrodiil is doing, he is actually saying that Cyrodiil is doing quite well. Uh, I believe it was... You, you can ask him about his home and then he says something about Cyrodiil uh, is a beautiful place, blah blah blah, blah rich cities, blah, and etc. And that I, I remember that leading me to conclude uh, that Cyrodiil is at this point in time, so in time of Skyrim, is doing quite well. Plus, we know that the Empire invested heavily into uh, the military, more so than probably anything else, because Titus Mead isn't an idiot. He knows that the Second Great War is coming. So, eventually, yes, I think that a win over the Thalmor is possible, because 
the Thalmor were also dealt a heavy blow. And what you said about all the farms being destroyed. They get a lot of war reparations from the Thalmor. And while that money can just grow crops, I understand that. But with money you can make sure that at least your economy gets growing again. And then eventually your farmers will once again start farming, etc, etc, etc. I hope that answered your question to some extent. I'm sorry if I rambled on far too much. Oh no, that was perfect, thank you. Okay. Well, uh, so what I, what I was saying before is that when you lose, you lose a lot of population and trade and productivity and basically your security has been on an all-time low for several years, a huge injection of gold uh, spent in a clever way can get you very far in things, uh, getting, back, getting things back on track. While a lot of gold has been sent to High Rock and Skyrim, I do think that the majority of the gold that they received in war reparations will probably have been put towards the restoration of Cyrodiil, which suffered by far the most of the remaining provinces. And as I say remaining provinces, uh, I think that the seeding of Hammerfell has been very useful to the Empire in the long term, because Hammerfell was also majorly damaged. If you think that, I mean, the, the Great War was a two-front war, one front was in Cyrodiil, the other front was in uh, Hammerfell. And I think that Hammerfell, well, maybe not to the extent that some areas in Cyrodiil have, but I think that you can easily put the entire area that, that where there was war in Hammerfell, you can easily put that all in the medium damage category. And basically all of Hammerfell was already damaged because of the civil war going on there before the Great War. So. In the end, uh, when it was revoked as an imperial province, it made it so that the empire would not have to pay for reparations in Hammerfell, leaving far more assets available to restore not only Cyrodiil, but also get the eco eco economies of High Rock and Skyrim back on track, which will eventually pull Cyrodiil's economy back up if you play a good economic game. I mean, if Hammerfell had still been part of the empire, I doubt that High Rock and Skyrim would have received any gold because then the Empire would have had two provinces to repair and now they only had one. So I think in the long term it, is fair, it has been very useful since it, put the, it probably put the Empire in a state where they could way more quickly recover their economies. But that's just speculation on my part of course. The quick restoration and the peace that this gold brought were probably the reasons why the gold concordat did not escalate into a large-scale rebellion in the provinces. It would later in Skyrim, uh, but I also covered that in my video on the uh, concordat itself, so I really recommend reading that, of uh, watching that, if uh, you want to know more about that. I think that if the Elder Scrolls Blades plays in the direct aftermath of the Great War, so say in the first two years after the war, you would see a rebuilding Tamriel in that game. And most people seem to agree that the game either takes place in High Rock or Cyrodiil. And while High Rock has not seen any combat, you would probably see things like a lot of new recruitment for security, soldiers returning home, shops being opened, farms being founded again, etc. If it takes place in Cyrodiil, I think we might see large-scale poverty in some places because of all the destruction, but also rebuilding action. So renewed investment in security, but also defenses, housing for those that lost their homes in the war, renewed investment in farms. Perhaps we could even see the remaining legionnaires that were still in Cyrodiil being ordered to help reconstruct farms or buildings or whatever, since those can now uh, be paid again using the gold. Something you would basically see across all the provinces would be probably be a lot of new children as the ending of the Great War would most likely lead to a sort of baby boom. In our own history, every time after a major war, the population of a country will quickly increase uh, if this country came out a little bit favorable after the war. And if the Empire received all these war reparations, I think that would put them at least a bit more favorable than when they wouldn't have. So. I think that those uh, reparations which could lead to a quick economic development could also lead to an eventual sort of baby boom in the empire. I mean, in our own history, every time you see uh, a major war happening and the major war uh, stops, then you will see the population quickly increase. The most apparent example of this is of course the baby boom in Europe after World War II. I think that this will also happen in the empire after the war as the new economic prosperity that the treaty could cause if the money is well used 
would have created very favorable conditions for such a baby boom. While I do not think that the Elder Scrolls Blades will be very lore heavy, I think that, well, uh, what I just said is a relatively likely speculation of what the situation would be in the two years or so after the war. But if we think in the long term, so in the next 10 years after the war, we would see most likely more public anger and, well, as the feeling of yay we have peace will probably be replaced by a shame of almost losing the war and losing the worship of Talos because even in Cyrodiil they couldn't possibly be happy. I mean especially in Skyrim since the Markarth incident the Thalmor can now freely roam Skyrim and the ban of Talos is strictly enforced in Skyrim and as far as we know that isn't the case yet in Cyrodiil and High Rock but we don't know much too much about the situation. This is basically all I had to say for the lecture. Uh, I prepared basically five full papers full, full of writing. I hope you all enjoyed it to some extent. And uh, well, if you have any questions, let me hear them now. I've got a quick question. Um, sorry, it was a bit daft. Um, of course, we know that the new game centers around the rebuilding of the blade. Don't the Pentelus Oculatus have most of their responsibility now? Like what? kind of role do you see them actually taking on in the future going forward? You mean the blades, which role they will have in the future? Uh, yeah, because I know they used to like protect the Emperor and they worked as like a secret, you know, spy network, agent network of the Empire. Haven't they effectively been replaced since, well, well, around the time of the Great War? That's a bit that even Bethesda apparently doesn't really know sure for themselves, as in Skyrim what we learned was uh, Basically after the fall of the Septim Empire, so after Martin Septim's uh, unfortunate death, the Blades basically stopped working for the emp Empire and basically just became their own thing uh, with their own decision making etc. However, they, didn't, they did not listen at all to the emp Empire at that point and that's why the Penitus Oculatus came about to protect Titus Mead the first. He actually instated the Penitus Oculatus uh, to replace the Blades at that point. However, when the Thalmor uh, came uh, well, to prominence in the Somerset Isles, the Blades saw them as a great threat to humanity and to all of Tamriel. So the Blades started working with the Empire again, instead of working for the Empire. That's the, that, that's the, that's the version of the story that uh, we get as in, the Emp in Skyrim, as in uh, the Blades don't, don't work for the Empire, but they work with the Empire because they see the threat of the Thalmor. Now, Ever since then, Bethesda has sort of, uh, well, put their back to that story because both in Elder Scrolls Blades, uh, of, I mean in Elder Scrolls Legends, they sort of pretend that the Blades still work for the Empire at some, for some reason. And in uh, the Elder Scrolls Blades uh, a little press, press conference, Todd Howard actually said they are the Empire stop agents. So. It doesn't make sense at all as the story in Skyrim was, well, they're a, they're a separate thing that are basically looking for the Dragonborn and no longer worry about the Empire, but work with the Empire because they saw such a threat in the Talmor. And then now suddenly in the latest iterations of the Elder Scrolls games that we got, so in Legends and probably also in Blades, they suddenly pretend like they are once again part of the Empire. So I cannot really give a definitive answer on that, unfortunately. <laughs> Well, hopefully we'll get some clarification. Um, thanks for answering the question, Bob. No problem. Anyone else? Any questions? Sure, uh, I have a question. So, uh, really thinking about uh, before what we talked about uh, politically, um, how are how do you think the Thalmor, especially looking forward forwards into Elder Scrolls Six, how do you think the Thalmor as a faction? Are going to be dealt with uh, on a grand political scale now that they uh, now that the sort of empire, as you said, are rebuilding and sort of focusing on their military and actually stand to oppose them. So, for example, with the Thalmor sort of have it, having basically almost completely taken over elsewhere and um, Valenwood, and but not really having much uh, of an influence in the northern provinces, uh, where do you think that we can see sort of the different projects, uh, provinces' allegiances lie uh, in this sort of coming conflict in history? 
Well, um, that's a hard one, I must say, because as I don't know what Bethesda will write, of course. I mean, we have seen in the past that they just write whatever they like and not really that which makes sense. Um, however, what I can say is that it also partly depends on what does Skyrim do. Uh, will Skyrim be independent? Will Skyrim still remain with the Empire? Will Skyrim be independent but have a close military alliance with uh, the Empire? I mean, that's also a possibility. And what does Hammerfell do? Uh, as far as we know, Hammerfell and the Empire are sort of friends again after the Great War now. Uh, because it's been 30 years and they basically realize we have a common enemy. So, if the Empire and Skyrim and Hammerfell all work together, whether Skyrim is independent or Skyrim is part of the Empire. If they all work together in a military alliance, I can see them being a threat to the Thalmor. But... If basically the Thalmor will be able to pick them off one by one. So first take Hammerfell because they are not allied to the Empire. And then just conquer all of Hammerfell and the Empire thinks hey that's not our problem. Then conquers independent uh, Skyrim and think the Empire thinks that's not a problem. Then I don't really think that the Empire or mankind as a whole really stand, stands a chance against the Thalmor. But... Also another factor is, uh, what, does the what do the Thalmor do back home? I mean, after the Great War, they must have lost some sort of uh, confidence at home. I mean, they basically bragged to their people, hey, we can defeat the Empire easily, and now they've had to compromise. I mean, if they, they, they still accomplished their goals, because the, the Blades were disbanded, uh, Talos worship was... Uh, uh, outlawed but they still sort of lost the war i mean it couldn't have feel felt like a victory they they are basically now bragging whenever you meet a thalmor in skyrim they're bragging yeah we won the great war but if you look at the facts then i mean it was a draw at best so i honestly don't know which uh, which way bethesda will take will take all this because if cyrodiil skyrim hammerfell and high rock all stand together at least in a military perspective then you can say that right now the chance is pretty even against Fallenwood elsewhere and Somerset Isles if you take into account that the Empire has been preparing for a second great war but then again Bethesda usually just does whatever they want and with that I conclude the lecture of today uh, I hope you all enjoyed it and for the viewers on YouTube if you ever want to attend one of these lectures I intend to do them once every one or two months depending how much enthusiasm there is. If you wish to attend one uh, you have to become a Patreon supporter. You can attend it with whatever pledge you do. So uh, a $1 pledge or a $10 pledge it doesn't really matter. Even with $1 you get the full rights to be here in one of these lectures. I hope you guys like this format. Uh, I decided upon this as a cool Patreon reward because it does not lock other people out of uh, f uh, content. I did not want to do exclusive lore videos or exclusive things. And this way I can still reward patrons, but also make sure that every single viewer gets all the lore. So I hope you guys like it. I, I know that some people hate on the concept, but hey, what can I do? With that said, if you liked it, like, subscribe. If you want to appear in one of these lectures or get your name at the end of every video, you can support me on Patreon. And if you want personal contact with me, my Discord and Instagram are both in the description of this video. And uh, yeah, with that said, I will see you all in the next video, which will be a normal video again, because these videos are kind of a bonus. The lecture videos will only be once or maybe once every two months. So see you later.